Robinson and I'm an aeromodeler and an engineer. Join me on a fascinating journey where I show you some of the techniques used in scale aeromodeling. Hello again modelers, welcome back to the channel. I've had a rather difficult few weeks. Uh, I went down with flu and it was quite quite bad and it uh, knocked me out for a couple of weeks. Quite, I don't think I've ever had flu that bad but, uh, but there we are. I couldn't even do any modelling. God, that shows how bad it was. Um, I've also th this last week started looking at those fairings again and as as you'll see from some excerpts that I'm about to show you, I did start planking the, uh, the wing fairings on the chipmunk because I've not been able to get out and get any of that foam and I thought well everybody else uses planking so I'll I'll just blank it. But actually what's happened is the fairing of the formers, it, they're, not, they're not fair. And fair is when you can take a row of formers and bend a piece of balsa over it and it'll touch all the surfaces in a gentle curve. And that's when all the bulkheads are what we call fared. These are not fared. So you can go from the first bulkhead to the second to the third and it's a nice radius and you can bend the wood and you can plank. But the leap from that bulkhead to the final section is a huge step out of alignment. And it's so far out of alignment, even a four mil wide piece of one eighth balsa was snapping. Now, yes, you could steam it, but the problem is if it's not fared, you end up with a huge lump and that's not right. So, so the actual former shapes are not quite right. So I'm having a rethink as to how <laughs> I'm going to do those. And that rethink is taking a long time. So I can't show you a video of what I'm doing because it's all up in my head. <laughs> so what I thought I'd do today, uh, you know, give you to something, uh, giving you something to watch, is I've been asked quite a few questions about some of the tools I'm using, mainly the permagrit tools. So... It would be lovely if I could get some sponsorship out of Permagrit for this, but that ain't going to happen. But what I'll do is I'll show you the Permagrit tools I use and some an, ass, an assortment of other tools that I use. It might be useful uh, for some of you that are setting up a workshop or something. Um, I, I, and as I've always said, I'm not an expert. I just I just enjoy playing at this. And I found some tools that I really like and I use all the time and some that just don't really suit me. Um, so So there you go. All right, so I'll dig a load of tools out, we'll spread them out on the bench, and we'll have a little bit of a, a show and tell video. All right, enjoy. Okay, modelers, I've got some bits out here that I'll show you. This is not everything that I use, but I just quickly looked around the workshop and thought, well, what do I use that's slightly different to maybe other modelers and may not be around? So I'm going to dive in straight away with the bit that people are asking about all the time, and that's the the sanding blocks that I'm using. So, get that out of the way in a moment. So, let's just separate out some of these. So, first of all, people have been saying, what's the green blocks that I'm using? Well, they are just blocks of balsa wood, and they originally came like this, with sandpaper on both sides, and they were from, I think it's balsa cabin or something like that and they were only a pound i think it was uh, somebody's bright idea to maybe use up scrap bits of balsa or something and they put sanded paper a uh, glued sandpaper to you know a course to one side or find the other and they sold them for a pound or something which were brilliant and i bought loads of these but over time obviously they um they go dull so all i do is i have <coughs> aluminium oxide um paper and this is a that's a 120 and that's an 80. I don't use very much of the 80 to be perfect honest, but it is quite good for foam because it's so coarse. Um, but you just gotta be gentle. Um, the 120 I use all the time. So these blocks, as they wear, then I put another layer of, of 120 on there or something like that to reuse them. And the this block, which is quite it's been around a long time now, as you can see, the thickness of the sandpaper layers that I've glued to it. Uh, just about as thick as the wood that formed the backing. <laughs> this one's been around a long time. And actually, the sharpness has gone from that. So I need to cut another chunk of sandpaper and just you who pour or contact adhesive onto there. And that gives me... It, this is an incredibly useful little sanding block. It gets used all the time. All the time. The big ones are fine. But this is the one I tend to turn to for doing most of my you know, building. 
So good, good little block that. Then I've also had an offcut of a, um, this was from the tiller from my, from my boat and uh, it was too long so I shortened it. And if you, again, if you just glue some aluminium oxide paper to that, it becomes a very useful size for, you know, doing, well, sanding curves on the inside of bulkheads or something like that. Very useful. And then there's a slightly smaller one. That's probably about the limit of what you can go to before the paper starts to crease and crack. But it's still a very useful tool for just easing out uh, a hole to... If, if you um, make a hole out of joining lots of little drill dots together, you can then put this in and actually make it round, which is which is quite useful. But what you do have to remember with all of these, and I try to stick to it but don't always manage it, is you need to use these on balsa. If you use it on ply, you'll kill them and you'll have to you'll have to put new paper on. Because I don't like doing that, I tend to reserve these for balsa only. Then we'll come on to the bits that everybody's been asking about. Everybody's been saying, what are these tubes, these sanding sticks you're using? And here's a coarse one, which is good for roughing out. And it's made of steel, um, and then it's painted, and then it's coated, well, it's coated before it's painted, I think, in tungsten carbide and it is incredibly sharp and incredibly tough and you can stick this in a drill and spin it um, you could do all sorts of things with this or just file sand make round holes or whatever plywood and balsa in fact hardwoods almost anything it's 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 a brutal bit of kit but but superb and when they get a bit clogged for example if you're gluing something or if you're sanding something that has epoxy on it then you simply dip this in acetone for uh, overnight and it should dissolve away all the nasties and you'll have another sharp tool again. These were bought over 10 years ago and they're st still really, really rough, really, really, really rough. This is the same size but in a fine version, which is probably the one I use more of. And you can see there I've, I've been actually attacking something that has blue in it. I'm not sure what that was. But anyway, I was, so that probably could do with a bit of a clean, but it's it's still really sharp, you know, and as I said, I bought most of these over 10 years ago. So then we come on to these little beasties, and these are really useful. These are steel bars, and this one is exactly a quarter inch wide, and one surface, just the one, is coated, again, with the tungsten carbide, and this is a fine I tend to only use fine when it comes to this sort of stuff. And what this allows you to do is cut perfect notches in bulkheads, ribs, that sort of stuff. And the notch will be exactly a quarter of an inch wide. It's, it's superb for that sort of work. Um, there is a smaller version with a one eighth inch wide piece of steel. They don't do a one sixteenth. Um, however, I'll show you in a moment how you can get around that. But the edges are really crisp, really sharp. So when you put it up against something and go and, and file down, it will create exactly a one eighth inch notch. Really, really useful bit of kit. Then we come on to the block versions and they do curved ones of these uh, and all different shapes. And you can actually buy just the metal pad so that you can stick it to whatever you want and you can bend it and make it into whatever shape you like. But I find they're quite expensive. So you know, I don't really want to cut these up and bend them. So I don't buy the sheets. I buy the tools, the blocks. And this is quite a nifty one. You, the, the shape means that you can go right up into a tight area and still sand perfectly 90 degree edge. Uh, the slight drawback is that edge doesn't go all the way to the end, which is a, is a bit of a, a nuisance. But it, it's not. It's not an issue. But this one is... Uh, I think they call them parallel sandy blocks. Um, this one's got a fine surface and a coarse. The fine is the one I tend to use all the time. They also do a longer one, fine on one side and coarse on the other, um, which is good for if you're doing leading edges and things like that. They do one with a curve, so when you're doing leading edges it actually puts a bit of a radius on, but I find this is a razor plane and then this is um, is probably fine. Razor plane, I must add this to the list. So that's that's that block. Okay, and they do a really long one. They do a one yard one as well, but I've never found the need for the really long one and it's expensive. Obviously the, these are 
These are all from Permagrit Tools, which is a UK manufacturer, and it's run by Tracy and Ian Richardson in the UK. Uh, but there are dealers all around the world, I believe, for these. And it's a, it's a wonderful tool. And one of the reasons, well, one of the ways I use this, as you've probably seen in, in several of the videos, is I use one of these sandy blocks as a flat surface that's quite grippy. And then I would just put my wood on the block and slide this permagrit tool along the surface like this. And you'll get a perfect 90 degree sanding. I mean, if you wobble, it won't be perfect. You have got to be careful and you have got to have good hand to eye coordination to get it right. But this is at least giving you one perpendicular edge. So it's a good tool, very good tools. Um, <clears throat> so I'll put that back with that. So that's the sanding side of it like that. When it comes to rotary sanding and stuff, then I did have a little battery Dremel, but the battery gave up on it and I haven't managed to figure out a way to solder a new one in yet. So, well, it's a bit more than soldering, unfortunately. So what I've gone back to is this is just a Rotorcraft mains driven um, rotary tool. And actually it, it hangs off the clamp, which, which is the base of the vise. So it just hangs there ready to go. Um, and I find actually the mains lead isn't that big of, of an incumbent, and I don't have to worry about it going flat or anything else. It, it works fine. Uh, I have been through two of these already. They um, <laughs> they do wear out. So um, and then for the tools that I use, again permagrip to the rescue. Now this was around seventy pounds this kit, uh, and it has a set of fine tools in there, such as this sort of I don't know what you call what. What shape you'd call that but it's kind of like a it's not a toroid because it's got a center but it's um i don't know a donut um but they've, they've got different shaped ones the cone ones are very good for opening up holes um, then you've got a, a round tipped one which again could be good for doing a fillet right down in something um there's a bigger cone one which i've yet to try which i like the look of it so you can't get it out this larger comb one is probably going to be one I use all the time. It's um, nifty. And then also in there is a, uh, I think they're called an arbor, the tool that you're, allows you to do this. And it allows you to fit a cutting disc. Now this is a permagrit cutting disc. So this is a tungsten carbide job. So um, I've yet to try that as well. This was only a recent uh, purchase from uh, a, a model show. So quite expensive, but they are good bits. Uh, I have loads of other little ones that I bought one at a time that I tend to attack. I use them first rather than going to these because I've not found a, a specific need for these yet. But part of having tools is is knowing what you've got and, and being able to go and select the right tool for the job rather than trying to make do with the wrong tool, which usually makes things quite hard. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for, for good ideas for tools. So I think that and the sandpapers just about covers the sanding side of stuff. Oh, no, it doesn't. These, these are nifty. Again, permagrit. You can see here, there's a, a very fine needle file. And this is actually the one <clears throat> that is a 16th of an inch wide. So if you needed to make 16th inch slots, you could use this. The only thing you have to be careful of is it has, it has the tungsten on all four surfaces. So if you're trying to go down into a notch, if you lean or twist, you will make the notch wider than the 16th. The trick is to just lay a piece of tape on the two sides and that way they won't cut, but it does add a fraction to the width. So if you put just two pieces of sellotape on there and then use it, you'll find that works. Um, they do all sorts of funky shapes and sizes. Uh, this one's really useful. You wouldn't believe it, but it, it really is because you can get right in and then sand along. It's really useful. And they do, uh, triangle sections, rounded, curved, hooked ones. Uh, there's all sorts as you can possibly see in here. Uh, they do handles so that you can have a better grip. This is a curved one with curved with flat on one side and curved on the other and a fine. I use this one a lot, which is why it's in the handle. Um, another one that gets used a great deal, slightly larger than the little needles, is this one and this is a just a basic flat and that's uh, that's very handy there are round needle files 
there are triangular, the square. <clears throat> this one is um, obviously gets used a lot, and it's a it's about a quarter round at its widest point needle again covered in permagrit, and you can see it's it's a bit grubby. This one gets used a great deal. I quite often put this into the drill and use it to make holes or enlarge holes slightly in ply bulkheads or ribs or stuff like that. I've got two of those. Uh, again, this one needs a clean. That's sort of what you can expect when it's been used on plywood. It just clogs up a little bit. Uh, dip it in acetone and away you go. Um, and that's it. And again, they're all made by Permagrit. Permagrit.com. Uh, www.permagrit.com. Um, and, and mention my name. You never know. We may get some sort of sponsorship deal out. And I've been trying to get money out of them for ages to, um, to sponsor... A couple of indoor events but so far no joy um, but they are really good and usually you buy them in a set um, which is you know obviously the most convenient way to get it I think there's probably two sets there the mini file set in fine and then the larger file set in fine and then a couple of extra needles and a couple of extra flats um, but they are they are really really good okay so moving on from that let's look at saws <clears throat> Because people ask about these as well. So what we got here are good to bad, but even bad are good. So as you can see, this is a basic cheap and nasty razor saw. And we're talking razor saws. Razor saws are what we really want. They're very, very thin bladed. This is an interesting one because it's flexible. It does unfortunately kink, as you can see, quite easily, quite coarse. But it's good if you wanted to cut right up against something and you could bend it to, to get your edge. Very useful. Then we'll go on to this. It's just another cheap saw blade, a little bit more expensive than that little first one. But it, it's a very fine one. And th these are good, just general purpose blades and they're not very expensive. So I, I buy quite a few of these. And as soon as they lose their edge, then I write glass only on them. And then they're they're um, dedicated to cutting fiberglass, carbon, anything that's really bad on your blades. Um, that's the one. These are, I I'd hesitate to say pull saws because then they're not. Um, but they are, these are made by, I think, Zona. And they're very, very nice saws. Um, I have a one and a two. They're both the same. But... One is for balsa, and two is not to use yet. As soon as that one gets blunt, then I'm going to go on to number two. Okay, so I've just numbered them so I know which one to favour first. Um, this is a nifty little saw. It's got a very short blade, a very narrow blade, and a stiff back. If you need to cut something very straight, very rigid, that doesn't flex at all. It's, it's really good for that. Don't use it very often, but in the right circumstance, it's brilliant. Here's another saw that is a lot more in, useful than, than I thought, and I've only really used it a couple of times in the last, last month or so. But it's a little pointed saw that can be cut and turned and zigzagged and everything. And it's got a really coarse blade, but you'd think it would be very difficult to use, but it actually cuts really nicely. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to clog up, so it, uh, it cuts ply, balsa, all sorts of stuff really, really well. I wouldn't use it on glass or anything like that. This is purely a wood tool, as are all of these saws, apart from this, this one that says glass only, which is an old blade. So I try to look after these. These are either Kona or Zona. I can't remember the name now. Um, I bought them in America when I was out there in, on a trip to Kansas. So they were bought in Wichita at a model shop there that I think subsequently closed down, but, which is a shame. So that's saws, okay? And I'm doing something really sacrilegious there. You should never let saws touch each other. Oh, God, I'm terrible. Because they tend to be hardened, and um, a hardened against a hardened could take the edge off it. So you should be more careful with your tools than I am there. Um, let's see, what should we look at next? So we've done that. That's cutting, so let's let's just quickly look at this, which is a tool for cutting. Follow on that same theme. I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but what we have is a block with two bits of sandpaper on. There's a coarse and a fine, and it runs in a channel, and will slide up and down. 
and then it runs up against a fence and you can see the the guide on the fence is set to degrees so if you needed to cut or sand a piece of balsa to exactly 90 degrees you could put it up against your fence set to 90 hold it up against there and then that would produce a perfect 90 degree on your on your wood um, if you needed 45 degrees obviously you'd turn it to that and then you'd cut it roughly to shape put it in your thing and uh, and away you go at 45 degrees it's mainly well it is only really in my opinion useful for balsa um, and if you're doing longer ons on fuselages you know where you've got two great longer ons at one at the top and one at the bottom and then you're putting diagonals in this is superb for making the little diagonal braces and um, getting the angles perfect this is a wonderful tool for that and that's really where it gets used most so that's that while I'm on that I'll, tell you, I'll show you this little tool which is quite useful this was from SleckUK.com, and I think a lot of the balsa suppliers and wood suppliers do it it's a little laser piece of plywood and it has uh, SWG hole sizes for piano wire so you can quickly judge how big a piece of piano wire is you're using and it also has little notches laser cut all the way around of the in this case the imperial balsa widths so 30 second 16 30 second um, 330 second what we got eight three sixteenth quarter three eighth right up to one inch and you can pl quickly put your piece of wood in the slot and, and know what size it is I know that sounds silly you should know your balsa sizes just by looking at it but sometimes the difference between 16 332 is a little close when you've got a big stack of wood and this this tells you quite quickly it will also tell you whether or not you've been given wood that say one eighth when actually it's three mil because it the fit won't be quite right and that's a bit of a sign because some model shops tend to buy in metric but don't tell you and then they sell it as the equivalent imperial that's a bit naughty when they do that um, but it does happen all stock gets mixed up and muddled up where modelers have picked it up to check the grain or the weight or something and they put it back in in a metric slot when it should be imperial but in my opinion most shops only sell either metric or imperial metric being quite hard to get but I know Slec do both and you can ask for either because they cut Slec by trees and then lumber you know mill the balsa from it so you can have your wood in whatever you like uh, even up to widths and lengths all sorts of stuff so we're very lucky with Slec in the UK we're um, they're a very good supplier and I use them a lot they do a lot of my laser cutting as well big plug for Slec <clears throat> So what we got next? What we got next? What should we look at next? We've done that. Let's have a look at measuring because this is always a is a bit of a good one. Measure twice, cut once. They say. <clears throat> so this is something I I use a lot. It's 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 only a cheap. Um, what do we call them? A caliper, I suppose. Caliper gauge. It was not really caliper. Um, a vernier slidey measury stick thing. <laughs> no doubt you'll correct me on what the flipping name is but it's really good for you know getting uh, diameters of stuff you know if you need to measure how big a gap is or something like that you, you can do it with the other edge 25.5 which is about an inch in my books it's very useful quite cheap I think this one was only something like ten dollars five six seven pounds um, the batteries tend to run out quite quickly but they have little um, watch batteries and that's all so if you've got a stack of them in the drawer then uh, then I'll keep you going the, the display starts flashing when the batteries are getting a bit low so that's one way of measuring widths and stuff like that um, this is a useful set of tools not used very often but um, but they, they can be quite useful so if you imagine you want to put a bulkhead inside this fuselage and that's the width of the fuselage um, what you do is you look for your appropriately sized one of these and you fit it in the in the gap and then you lock it off the little thumb wheel at the top and you slide it out and it won't move now that distance there is then the distance across the inside of your bulkhead so you 
I mean, this is an easy one to get at. You could easily have just measured it with a ruler. But if it's deep down in a fuselage where you have to lower this in like that and then turn it, then you can lock it and then turn it and lift it out again. You can get a dimension that you just can't get to with a ruler. Very useful. The only drawback is you have to buy them in a set because they, they go from a certain size to a certain size and then that's it. If you want to do smaller than that, you have to use this one. Let's unlock it again. Use this one. And if you want to go smaller than that, you're getting the idea here, you have to use that one. Smaller than that, you have to use that one. And they're really cheap, you know, a, a tenner for, for a set. As I say, don't get used very often, but when you need that measurement and you think, how the hell am I going to get this? And, and you can reach down in with sticks of balsa and slide one against the other and glue it, and that'll give you the distance. And that's traditionally how you do it. But this is a very quick and simple way of doing it for a few quid. So, um, so they're good. Still on measuring. <clears throat> I've shown this before in uh, several videos. It's a, a level, they call it a level box. And all it does is it, it tells you the angle or, or how true your surface is. And I use it quite a lot for incidences, wing incidences and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, very useful little tool just to make sure your fuselage is absolutely level on the bench or if it isn't level it doesn't matter as long as you know what that level is and you can recreate it so that all your surfaces are the same wing, in, um, wing seats tailplane seats are all nice and true um, measuring still measuring this was quite expensive and a silly purchase really but I do use it a bit more than you'd think what it is it's a steel ruler stainless steel and it's got its metric so it's up to 300 millimeters the ends are accurate to the ends of the ruler which if you take a traditional uh, ruler they quite often only have one end that's true um, which is not necessarily an issue but something like a ruler a plastic ruler it is because they don't go all the way to the end um, but this one does both ends but the really nice thing about it is the increments are right down to a tenth of a millimetre and they're cut. They're, um, they're cut with a plasma, I, I think a plasma. But what it means is you can put a 0.5 millimetre pencil into exactly the distance you want to measure. So if you want to measure 81.9, you go along 81 and then you can find, there's 81, and you can, uh, how do you do 81.9? No, oh, no, it's not 81.9, you can only do it in quarters of a millimetre, but I mean, seriously, quarter of a millimetre is pretty accurate, isn't it? So there's 81, and there's 81, and there's 81.25, 0 0.5, 75, and then there's 82. So it's very accurate, and because it's got the holes, you can put a pencil through and mark the paper or whatever you're you're trying to to measure through the other side about about 25 pounds so the most expensive ruler i've ever bought but it is in certain circumstances perfect where are we right we could go on to drilling or we could go on let's let's have a quick look at clamps so here's a selection of clamps i have quite a few of these and the, the blue ones are softer um, I have loads, so uh, this is just a small selection. I have some of these slidey clamps, which woodworkers use, and these are very, very useful. And you just ratchet them along. Um, very useful. I have several of those in several sizes. So again, if you're going to a, a jumble or a car boot sale or something like that, you can often pick these up for next to nothing. These were silly cheap <clears throat> and are fairly rubbish. Um, you know, if you were to use them for woodworking and stuff, they're, you know, they're out of alignment. They're not very true. They're not very well made. They're incredibly cheap. But for clamping bits of balsa and bits of ply, they're perfect. They're perfectly adequate for that. And again, I've got loads of these in all different shapes and sizes. Um, always useful. Always useful. Let me just show you some of the smaller clamps. <clears throat> so I found more stuff over there while I was looking that I thought, oh, what do we see in these? So let's have a look at this little lot. These are all very similar. 
just in different sizes. So these are like, I'd call these bulldog clips. And they're very good for laminating ply and things like that, or laminating balsa, two ply, ribs, stuff like that, really good. And that's a quite brutal one. They're quite vicious. This is the next size down. Still quite brutal, but they, they do a thinner section and not quite as brutal as the other ones. You can also get these plastic ones, but um, I've only got a few. I could do with some more of those. <clears throat> and you can come down to the next size. Ooh. You can see I like these curry pots, these um, fast food curry pots. These are quite small um, and they don't get used a lot. But again, the spring tension is still a little bit high. So it's all right for laminated plywood to balsa, stuff like that. But it has its limits. If I really want to be gentle, and I use these a lot for the indoor models, I have these, these little clips. And they're, they're hair, I think they're called hair grips or something like that, but they're hair clips. You've got to be careful. Some of them have these dots halfway up and they're actually pins. And they're good because they hold whatever they're trying to grip quite firmly. But they can leave a mark in balsa. So you have to look around and see what you can find because you can get them that don't have the pins. And I thought I had some in here, but I'm not finding any straight away. Um, you can also get some that are like giant crocodile crypts and they are serrated. Not terribly useful, but again, in the right application. So that's clamps. <clears throat> um, here's a tool and they come in a set. And that's probably the largest one. And what they are are rods with you know chrome ends on them. And that, that was a set that went down to probably three mil, two and a half, three mil. And then there's a smaller set here, a wooden set, that goes much, much smaller. And I quite often use these with just a little ball on the end of them. I quite use these uh, use these to Mark litho plate, that can be one thing, you know, if you want to simulate rivets. Or if the, the slightly larger ones, there's a slightly larger one in there, you can use this um, to create a fillet in glue or in filler. Um, you know, maybe where two surfaces meet and you put a fillet of epoxy in, you can then usually just lick this to get it, make it moist and then run that along and it'll, per it'll form a perfect curved fillet. So they're very useful. Or, as I say, in litho plate, you can use them to form the litho plate over a mold or something like that. You can use these. I don't know what they're called, to be perfectly honest, but they're uh, used in um, modeling, you know, when you're, when you're modeling clay sculptures and stuff like that. So you need to look in the art supplies section for that sort of stuff. Right, so, We've done that bit, that bit, that bit, and that bit. Let's have a look at drilling. <coughs> it's another thing we have to do quite a bit of. So, for the drilling side of things, for the lightweight and tiny stuff, I tend to use one of these. Um, and this is, oh, I can never remember the name of it. But um, as you move that pin up and down, it spins it, it spins the drill bit. And they're very good for making the first initial hole in, I don't know, servo arms and all sorts of little, for making pilot holes, they're very good. <clears throat> if you want to make slightly bigger holes, then I found this drill bit set from Expo models. And it goes right down to half a millimeter in size, but the drill bits are long. And I find this is very useful when you're trying to reach into a hard to reach, a hard to access area. And also if you're going through a balsa block, and you need to go a bit further than a normal drill allows you, then this is good. And you can go through rib bays in a wing when the ribs are quite a distance apart. These all sort of go through. So very useful set of drills, long ones. And the other useful thing is they go up in 0.1 of a millimetre, which is really nice. Just don't break them. I've also got 
again we're drilling this is a, a set of drill bits uh, twist drill bits but they're micro and these are from uh, Expo Expo tools when you open it up you'll see that it allows you to fit very tiny drill bits into the Dremel because a drill bit that tiny normally the chuck won't go down small enough to allow you to um, to fit it so that's the beauty of these they're actually on a constant size shaft and those drill bits go go right down in size so that's um, 0.6 of a millimeter right up to 1.5 millimeter very useful set of drill bits but again don't break them um, we're back on to this is I'm including this in the drill bits bit but actually these are similar but we're talking about grinding bits so if you really spin the Dremel up quite quickly or the rotary tool quite quickly these are uh, shaping tools um, and they work very well if you're trying to shape uh, filler or something that you've sculpted into a into a specific shape it's also good for clearing glue away from areas where you maybe didn't want glue to go um, not large areas but just just little areas good little tools um, with drilling holes you tend to want to put screws in and stuff like that so I have here a very small um, tap and die set which is quite good um, most mostly I use metric stuff nowadays so it's m2 m2.5 m3 and m4 tends to be the sizes I use um, you just got to remember that some of the sizes actually use a different pitch so you've got to be a bit careful um, and that's where a gauge like this comes in which as you can see doesn't get used very much but um, <clears throat> this gauge is used as you can see it's got just about every pitch you can imagine and you can use it to, to measure pictures of screws and you know thread sizes um, tip angles it's a very um, very universal tool for machining um, metric Imperial Whitworth so there's a lots of different thread sizes on there and it's that's very useful when you've got a bolt that you don't know what sort of nut you need and you haven't got the nut so you want you want to buy some this can tell you what those threads are so that you're buying the right the right kit um, these are also used for when you're sharpening your drill bits and stuff like that they're used to work out the angles and depths and all that sort of stuff i've not really messed around with that but that's what it's for so sorry if this video is a bit dry but um people have asked what i use so i thought this is probably the easiest way to show you this is an interesting little tool probably more familiar to you guys that use prop driven aircraft and you have to ream out your propeller hub to match the size of the motor uh, to match the yeah motor shaft so it's a stepped reamer and it steps down to typical sizes that you would have uh, for a propeller it's a very useful tool however if you want to go to a size that isn't one of those then there is another tool you can get and this one I do use a fair bit more than and it's a reamer again but this time it's a tapered reamer now you've got to be careful with this because if you imagine you uh, reamed out a propeller you would end up with one side of the hole being bigger than the other side so you've got to be careful that you go in from both sides in an even amount and you'll still end up with a slightly tapered in and tapered in from either side hole so you've got to be careful the stepped is better because it's consistent but um but sometimes that's the only way to get the size of hole you want so i would suggest you go in with a step dreamer and then use the uh, the angled or tapered uh, reamer to finish it off holes again we'll just have a quick look at this so if you imagine let's go and get something real <clears throat> here's the tailplane for that blessed chipmunk say i wanted to drill holes in the middle of the trailing edge for these robot uh, pin pin hinges this tool has actually got another part in there it's, it's actually got two sizes quarter inch and an eighth inch and I just keep both parts 
attached at the same time just to make it easier. But if you put one in, do it up, and then you put this that way and that way, either side of the surface, and then slide it along. And with these sides both flat and level with each other, that hole, if you just drill down, this will keep your drill straight and will make sure that the hole is right in the center of the two surfaces. So even when it gets narrow, it's still the same. Very useful bit of tool for doing exactly that. And it is made by Robart. So, um, and as I said, they have two fittings, depending on whether you want to use the large hinges, which are quarter, or you use the smaller one, the medium ones, I think they call them, which are eighth. Um, I don't know that they do one for smaller. Uh, and that's that's pretty good. Pin hinge locator. Okay, we're nearly there. Um, T-squares. I have lots of these engineer T-squares. Well, not lots, actually. I've got, I think, three big ones. I think these are six inch and these are three inch. Um, and they're great for just getting angles perfectly straight, bulkheads, getting them all aligned and, uh, and that sort of thing. Very useful, not very expensive, but um, and you don't need hundreds, but I've got six and that's that's perfect. Um, quick look at some pliers. I found these uh, some time ago, uh, Med Medentra stainless steel pliers. And they're cool because they've got a round <clears throat> pin. One jaw is round and the other is flat. And it's very useful if you're bending lithoplate or tube, piano wire, that sort of stuff. You could put a radius in depending on which way you bend. You could either put a sharp bend in it if you bend it towards the, the square um, section, or you can put a radius in it. Very useful. Right, where are we? These I've been asked about several times. These tubes, <clears throat> these are sharpened steel tubes or brass tubes. And they're sharpened, as you can see, on the outside. Okay, and they're they're thin, thin walled steel, with a plug in one end, drilled, and then it has a shaft. Okay, and it has an opening as well to allow you to clear the the you know the waste out from the middle. So what you do is you either put this in a drill, which I don't tend to do. I just use it by hand. But if you put this up against a piece of balsa wood. Let's try to find a scrap piece. There's a little bit of 16th. I'm not going to use the large one because the large one's a little bit more brutal, but they come in sizes. This one's a brass one, but again, it's polished on the outside. Same, same sort of effect. And this is, this is made by uh, a chap called Gaskin, G-A-S-K-I-N. And it's a Gaskin soft bore drilling tool. And it all uses very thin wall tubing. So the idea is, I'm not sure if you can see this, but you put it up against your balsa and you rotate it. And it cuts, <laughs> it usually cuts a cleaner hole than that, but there's a, there's a little bit of there that I didn't um, clean up very well, but it cuts a very nice hole. Um, and then you just need to clear it out by poking something. I'm trying to see where my bit of piano wire. I keep a piece of piano wire for clearing glue tubes and stuff like that. Just poke it through and you can push the, the cut bit of balsa out. You want cylinders for a radial engine or a little indoor model. Those little discs are useful. So that's the Gaskin softball set and it comes in a variety of sizes, I bought just the five, I think it's one inch, and uh, I can't actually remember the size of the things. But they're great if you want to lighten balsa wood ribs on small indoor models or something like that. These are great for creating lightening holes. Okay, nearly at the end, clamp. This is a very nice little tool. Um, again, not sure what the name of it is, but it's a, it's a clamp and it allows you to clamp small pieces of litho plate or piano wire or small, usually met metal parts. Um, horns, that sort of stuff. It allows you to clamp them and then actually needle file them. It's usually for really tiny little bits and pieces that you're making. 
Uh, so you put the part in there, you just clamp it up and away you go. Very useful tool. Right, nearly finished. I think I'll just um, I'll just I'll, I'll finish on adhesives. Okay. So the current adhesive I'm using that I'm I'm quite enjoying is this Type Bond Ultimate wood glue, waterproof. It doesn't take that long to dry, not as long as you'd think. But it's it's very good. It's very hard, but um, it's dry after an hour or so. But um, it's really hard after a day or two. It's really good, really good. I'm really impressed with that glue so far. Um, for CA, I'm tending to use either Zap or Deluxe Materials uh, Rocket. They all seem much a muchness. Uh, I have found that Rocket seems to last a little bit longer in my workshop. The Zap seems to go off a little bit quicker, but that's probably because I'm just building too slowly. I should get my finger out. Um, I've just recently tried a new epoxy. Uh, this is a Deluxe Materials Speed Epoxy. This is a 20 minute one. And it is about 20 minutes to, to a good hardness. But again, like most epoxy, it doesn't really get hard for two or three days. Uh, you know, really hard. Um, but it does get really hard, which is what you want. You don't want one of these epoxies that just sets to rubber and then stays as rubber. Well, maybe you do. don't know. But I don't. This is a, a nifty little material. This is Red Devil One Time Lightweight Ready Mix Filler. Um, and when you pick it up, it's, there's hardly anything to it. It's really lightweight and it's like powder. It really is just like, it's lighter than foam, what you're seeing there. Um, and it's a filler, but it's a filler for balsa wood, okay? Or ply, but it's for the raw airframe. This isn't for on top of glass fiber or primer or stuff like that. This is on top of the wood. So what I tend to do, what I favor, is that I build the airframe from wood, balsa wood, then I sand it to the right sort of shape. Any gaps or holes, I use that Red Devil lightweight filler um, to bring it up to smooth. And it's, you know, it doesn't take very long to dry and it a very, very light sanding and it sorts it out. Then when you put the glass on top of that, you've got a smooth surface to work with. It, it, it's just to fill any gaps between balsa sheeting or anything like that. Um, that's where it's perfect. Okay, I'm just having a quick look round, see what else I should really be showing you. There's probably loads of other things. Um, I found a DeWalt electric drill to be really useful. Um, it's quite small. This one is just 12 volt. I've got a, a 10 volt one, which is even smaller, very similar type of um, type of drill. It should be down in the garage. But that's, again, very handy for, you know, just general drilling without being big and cumbersome. Um, the last thing you want is some great big cord driven five kilowatt pneumatic hammer type drill when you're working on model airplanes. But that one is perfect because the trigger is really gentle and the speeds come in really, really slowly. So you can, you know, you can alter the speed really nicely. Really good. So if I've thought, if I've forgotten something and you want a bit more of an explanation, I guess you just stick it down in the comments. And there we go. Cheers for now.